I'm Park Howell, and welcome to The Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. If you heard last week's show, then you know how I am evolving as a brand and business storyteller. Because I mentioned David Christian's new book, Origin Story, and how it blew my mind and gave me a whole new perspective on the raw energy contained in the stories we tell. Plus, I now have an even greater appreciation for being a lifelong learner because what I realize is when you stop learning, it's like exercise. Entropy takes over and decline sets in. But that's the beauty of evolution. The mentally and physically strong will survive. The weak will, well, they may inherit the earth, but probably six feet under. Just ask Darwin. So where am I going with all this? Well, on today's show, we're still talking about evolution. The evolution of a brand storyteller. You remember my good buddy, Dr. Randy Olson, mentioned him many times. He's been a a guest on the show a couple of times. He is the revealer and the professor of the Ann Button Therefore Story Foundation, what I call the DNA of story. You see what happens when you hang out with Harvard PhD evolutionary biologists? Anyways, Randy connected me with yet another of his USC film school alums who is doing big things in Hollywood and in New York. His name is Jason Ensler, and no doubt you have watched many of his shows. He's got a whole list here. Let me just hit a couple of them. Uh, He has directed and executive produced seasons of two of The Exorcist for FBC. He directed the pilot Redliners for NBC and was the executive producer and series director of Red Band Society for Fox through ABCS. Other shows he's either executive produced or directed on include CWS's Cult, Heart of Dixie, TNT's Franklin and Bash. I mean, the list goes on and on, including Newsroom for HBO, Grace and Frankie, and he even in the past directed an episode of The West Wing. Anyways, today you will learn a lot from Jason's evolution as a Hollywood storyteller as you grow in your brand and business storytelling. You'll learn the importance of observation and finding the hidden moments that make your stories powerful, the seven elements of visual storytelling, and how to balance the soul and science of storytelling to connect with your audiences. So please welcome Jason Ensler to the business of story. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. So great to track you down finally. I know we we started touching base at the end of last year and you have been busy directing all over the place. Fox just picked up one of your new shows. So really, really great to track you down and tell you right and have you on today's show. Yes. Thank you. And thank thanks for tell you right, because it gave me a little decompression where I could take a moment. Do they have a film festival going on up there this weekend? Yeah. Or? In fact, I just, uh, I just watched seven or eight documentaries in the Mountain Film Festival, all fan- fantastic, just covering various topics from refugees to poaching to, you know, extreme sports to diet. So it's a good mix of the world is a shit show. And uh, maybe you should get outside a little more. (laughs) Into the shit show. Good. So, So Jason, you have been directing in Hollywood and film and TV for a long time. Can you take us back to a scene in your life for a moment? Maybe it's even when you were a little kid that you knew this is what you were going to be doing. I'm not sure. I, you know, I didn't. I, I started acting at a young age, but but the reason I was pushed to acting is maybe maybe this is a conversation for my therapist. But you know, I was never picked for the dodgeball team or the baseball team or the football team or any team, and it may have been a function of the fact that you know 
I had all my grandfather's hand-me-down clothes, so I was wearing like hemmed plaid pants, and I was teased often, uh, and I was bullied often. In fact, I was I found that I was punked a lot. There's a specific sort of funny but traumatic incident where I was walking home from the bus stop one day. I think it was in third or fourth grade, and this whole team of kids came up to me, and they were sort of bragging about all the music that they knew. And I was sort of playing along because I wanted to be cool. And they were like, have you heard about the band, The Far Out? And I don't know why I remember this. And and I was like, I just trying to be cool. So I was like, oh yeah, The Far Outs, love The Far Outs. And they were like, there's no band, The Far Outs. You're a loser. So, <laughs> and, and it was it was like seminal stupid moments like that that made me start to take in all the pop culture that I could to watch movies and learn music and soul music and R&B and rock and roll and jazz and classical. And I had this, I developed this boundless, endless hunger to never be punked again. And, <laughs> and when you start studying like that, you start learning the basic building blocks of, of how people tell stories, whether it's through music or dance or art or literature or movies. And, and so it became a way to protect myself <laughs> from moments like that. And, and it also became a part of, of a journey of obsession of, uh, with story. Uh, to, where did you grow up? I grew up on Long Island. You know, it was like all the, you know, it was, it was Irish kids and Italian kids and Jewish kids all kind of mixing from like the suburban sprawl from the city from the generation before. And so everybody was kind of broken up into their cliques. And so, you know, one group would, would tease the other group and usually it was the Jewish kids who were being teased. Yeah. So... That's where all yeah. that angst and anger comes from that runs Hollywood, I guess. Is that right? I guess. Yeah, that and the asthma. <laughs> so you uh, grew up on Long Island. You went to Brandeis University for an undergrad and then off to USC Film School? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. And then you graduated with uh, our mutual good friend, Dr. Randy Olson. He's the one that made this connection, as he has done so many times for me. And, uh, and uh, he has just so many wonderful things to say. He told me, he said, out of all the class, of everyone in the class that uh, you all graduated in, you are the shining star. Now, now, do you hold on to that moniker? No, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I just, you know, it's funny because we all have our struggles no matter where we are. So, you know, I'm in the day-to-day -day of my own political struggles with with my career or with the studio or with notes or with you know managing personalities so it's hard to take a mo it's it's you don't have the luxury of taking a moment and 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 saying uh oh look at me i'm the shining star cuz you're busy and you're doing your work so just like everybody's doing their work so it's great that it's nice that he says that i think a lot of people from USC have been very successful and it's it's it was a great community and it was great to it's great to it was one of the best things about USC is the community that came out of it because i'm 20 years later i'm still 25 years later i'm still in touch with that that whole group of people I went to film yeah. school with. You know, our son Parker graduated from film school at Chapman University in Orange. They have quite a quite a great program there in 2010. Yeah. And he says now there's this Chapman mafia, as they call it, happening in Hollywood that he gets to be a part of. And it's a lot, just like you said, a lot of the folks that graduated in and around that time and they reach out to each other. And he says, we've got set designers and audio guys and lighting folks and directors and producers all out of that group of graduates. And he says, it's just so much fun working with them all. And they're running around town, getting bigger and bigger projects as their careers develop. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, to this day, I'm still calling people for, I'm either calling people who've worked in the business to get references on other people, uh, you know, people from USC. I'm hiring people from USC all the time, or I'm looking to them to hire me. And and we all support each other because we know how hard it is out there. So from my first job at NBC, which I got through a friend of mine at USC, to yesterday when I hired a, a, a woman who graduated from USC with me, and now I've hired her to come and direct The Passage. So it's, you know, it's all about those yeah. relationships. Well, let's talk a little bit, little bit about your evolution as a storyteller. So our listeners, of course, are, are brand managers and content marketing folks and business people that aren't always running around the Hollywood scene. You know, we're all consuming your content and so forth. But what I would like to do is connect the evolution of a storyteller like you that, I mean, you do this for a living, creating long form content for us all in an extraordinarily competitive world that is completely changing, it seems like, every every quarter. 
something new is coming out on online channels and so forth. So yeah. take us, if you would, a little bit. Let's go back to when you were punked as a kid and you started learning about storytelling. Did you create stories and were you shooting film in high school and college? Or when did you really start getting into becoming a story creator? Well, you know, I, one of two things was happening when I was a kid. I was either punked or I was ignored. And um, being ignored has its advantages because you are you are given the space to observe the hidden moments, you know, the quiet moments that exist in between, you, you know, moments that would otherwise be insignificant. You know, you you really start to observe people and you find that they're, that everyone is struggling and everyone has sorrow and everyone is has a tension or a conflict about something. And usually those things are surprising. And so you you two things happen. One, you develop great compassion for people because everybody's going through it. And two, you I have found that I am always in my storytelling looking for those hidden moments, those moments that you don't expect. So, you know, you're looking for those vulnerabilities. Um, so that was the beginning of it. I, you know, I think as an actor, I I found a safety in acting in high school because I could speak other people's words, disappear into other people's characters, and not worry about you know if you're if you're doing Shakespeare or Brecht or Cole Porter, you know no one's no one's no one's punking you, <laughs> so you're you're kind of free on that stage to express this this mm -hmm. thing with confidence, uh, and so it gives you confidence, uh, and that was sort of the beginning of of that storytelling uh, journey. I there were a couple seminal moments that pushed me away from acting. One of them, I was, when I graduated from uh, college, I was doing stand-up comedy in college. It was part of my acting. I had started directing in college for for various reasons. One, because a girlfriend told me that uh, I directed one short one-act play and I had been in a play with her and she said to me, oh my God, you're such a better director than you are an actor. So, you know, you 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 take that in a little bit. It's that moment, whether it's true or not, it quite often informs then who we are later on down the road and we live into that. Yeah, you live into it. And maybe I think a part of me was looking for a way out of acting because because I, uh, you know, I, I, I was fine. I was good. I never felt like I was, I, I always felt like something was missing in my role as a storyteller. And I found out, I found out uh, in in one of the more seminal moments, I was in New York and I was doing stand-up comedy and with a couple of friends. We were all sort of stand-ups in New York and we're still in touch. You know, one one works for Goodyear Tire, another, you know, we've all kind of gone different ways. And um, and this was back when uh, Janine Garofalo was doing stand-up and Bobcat Goldthwaite. And, and I remember I had worked my way up to getting like a five, 10 minute spot at different comedy clubs and they'd pay you like 25, 50 bucks, which was like, <laughs> shit, I'm making money. And I, there was a place called the Boston Comedy Club in Greenwich Village. And I remember I had a slot. I was on it like 9.30 on a Thursday night. I was all ready to go. I had my, you know, I had rehearsed it and it was all, you know, uh, again, it was about trusting yourself as a storyteller. And I don't think at that point I did. I still have my moments. Uh, but but, you know, I had rehearsed it and it was to the letter and it was it was very firm and it was too firm. You know, my comedy was mm -hmm. was too rehearsed. But I didn't know that then. I thought I was killing it. And right before I went on, the MC says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest. Please welcome. This is 1991, 1992. Please welcome Dave Chappelle. Oh, God. And <laughs> so Dave Chappelle is this young guy who's up and coming. He gets on stage and does the funniest extemporaneous half hour of comedy I've ever heard in my life. And he killed it. And then I had to follow that. And I, I went home after that night and I was like, I need to do something I'm great at because <laughs> was this that is the universe it. saying, Hey, uh, Jason, we've got another idea for you. <laughs> and the only way I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think, I think, you know, the next decade of my life, I mean, I ended up applying. There's other reasons I went to USC film school and found other ways, but I, 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 I went back again. It was another moment where I went back to studying art and music and dance and theater and cinema to say, all right, how, how else can you skin this cat? <laughs> and that's okay. And the universe punked you by throwing Dave Chappelle in front of your, your set. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, it's funny. Around the same time, I was I was on tour as an actor with Little Shop of Horrors, and we did like you know twenty three states in six months. And on the bus, 
we would collect videotapes wherever we were, we, you know, whether it was Kentucky or Michigan or, or, or Colorado, wherever we were, we would like go to yard sales and get videotapes because the bus had a VHS player and we would watch movies for 12, 13 hours a day. And sometimes many, many times. I mean, I remember watching, I think we watched Terminator seven times and you, you, that, ex, that experience led me to applying to USC film school. Cause I just got obsessed with cinema, with the art, with the, because cinema takes all of those elements that I had been immersing myself in arts, art, dance, literature, music, all that. And it make, and it's sort of the, the cumulative art form. So for me, it was like the pinnacle of it, that expression. So when you watch a Terminator seven times, is that a little bit like being that kid that was ignored that you start observing hidden scenes within the movie that it's going by so quickly before that you don't always pick up? Yes. And you start seeing things that you don't even know you're seeing until you learn to see them later in your career or in your studies. So, you know, you start seeing the use of lenses and you start seeing the, 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 the visual foreshadowing and the motifs that Cameron was doing in that film. You start seeing the way he moves the camera. And I, it's funny. I remember there's this shot. It's right before the shootout in the parking garage where Michael Bean says, he's, this is what he does. This is all he does. And there's a there's a shot. It's a car to car shot following the I forget the car that they were driving. Um, following the car, and you get this sense of vertigo and movement. And it's the it's the speed of the car and the and the ramp up the hill. And there's that that choice is so specific. You know, it didn't have to go up a hill. It didn't have to go at that speed. It didn't have to make that turn. But it's all those decisions that start to you know that I wanted to uncover and discover and unpack so that I could figure out how to do it myself. What was one of the biggest things then you learned when you went to USC film school? You had all this experience as an actor and you were doing some directing and a little bit of stand-up comic and watching this. What was your first one, a you know, real big aha moment about storytelling that just said, oh, of course. I think there was a there was a professor named Bruce Block who was a, he was a visual consultant on movies like Ordinary People and irreconcilable differences. And he, he, you know, I always say that like you have all these epiphanies in your twenties and then as you age, you have less of these epiphanies. You're just like, oh yeah, right. Cause you, cause you realize that you're, you're not learning it as much as you're remembering it. You know, it's that whole idea that you, um, that you, you know it <laughs> from like primordial knowledge, it's all in you. And then you just have to be reminded of it. And what he, what he, the, the, the window that he opened up into filmmaking was he said, no matter what happens on a set, no matter what actor is giving you trouble or what writer is, is, is handcuffing you, you always have these tools to go back to that no one's going to, to um, get in your, you know, that, that is your jurisdiction. And those tools were these seven elements of cinema that can help elevate and tell better stories, which were, if I can remember, color, light, space, movement, orientation, line, and tone. And so no matter where you are, you can always go back to the script and you can apply those, those elements and those rules to help control and tell your story. And that was a big, that, and I, I remember we took that class, I think two, two or three years into the program. And I remember wishing that we had because you experiment a lot before then on uh, we had super eight millimeter and you just you're an idiot you just you tr you throw you throw spaghetti at the wall and you just try music and try images and you get your friends to be actors and you 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 just tell stupid stories and you do whatever you can and to not have had those tools at the beginning i guess that's the lesson is like instinctually how much of those of those things those color light space movement orientation line tone are you are you using instinctively and now that you know how to use them how do you how do you practice so that they that the other side of the arc is that they become instinctual again but now you really know how to use them does that make sense mhm mm it does so can we go to those for uh, for a minute because i've not heard of the seven elements of cinema so you start with color is that the color or the art direction that is going into the overall piece to keep keep it consistent yeah, color is the easiest thing to control because paint is cheap and you can mm -hmm. you can choose the color of a uh, a piece of wardrobe and you can usually you can you can f you can look at the story and find ways to 
use color to express character. You could use color to express subjective emotion. You could use color to to even arc a film. Uh, the the example that he always used, which is astounding when you watch it in ordinary people, is the first time he goes to see the therapist, the the who who, who played Judd Hirsch. The first time he goes to see him, the color temperature is cool. Um, there's a blueness, there's a depressiveness to it. It represents Timothy Hutton's emotional state at the time. And then two things happen. One, you move through the autumn in the story. And also the color, every time he goes to the therapist, starts to warm gradually until finally there is an intimacy between the patient and the doctor and you were in this warm, glowing orange that you weren't in in the beginning. So just that use of color and the arc of that color tells the story visually so much so that if you were to turn the sound off, you would you would understand that intimacy. Mm-hmm. And it's just all done in that background that I think that most people don't take in when they're watching a movie. I remember I was studying... Um, well, I went to a I went to a workshop with a director from Saturday Night Live that did the opening, and he was talking about visual storytelling, and I was fascinated by it because I knew nothing about it. And then I watched uh, Paul Giamatti's movie Win Win, and it was oh, the yeah. first time that I really noticed color, the color palette, and the blocking of how that movie is completely shot. You have circles and you have squares. You have the circles of the mat where he feels the freest, where he can be himself. And then the rest of the movie, he shot in squares. He's in window frames. He's in doorways. He's in hallways. And I remember watching it, and I looked over at my brother. I said, you see what they're doing here visually? They're, they, Paul Giamatti is totally boxed in in life unless he's at the, at the wrestling, you know, in the gym as a wrestling coach. Right, <laughs> right. My brother says, that's still bullshit. That's bullshit. Yeah. That's, I yeah. said, no, I don't think so. I think they actually yeah. designed that. <laughs> and you could geek out on that stuff all day. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, did, I did a pilot last year that was, um, it, was a, it was a very sort of cheeky action show. And I, I ended up looking at Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the Doug Lyman film for inspiration. And I was surprised to find that Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt are are constantly framed within boxes, within windows, because because their situation traps them. They're each mm-hmm. lying to each other. They're super spies that are are assigned to kill one another. And so it's not until they know about each other that the that they are free of those boxes visually. Yeah. And I was surprised that a popcorn pop culture, you know, like a, a juggernaut of a movie like that still applies those rules because those rules are what make visual storytelling worth watching. Yeah. Well, it takes so much more depth in the story. It presents so much more depth in the story. You're not just getting the characters and the plot and the script, you know, the the the, the writing in it, but how they place them. And the whole lens thing is beyond me. So that's something that I guess you got to watch the Terminator seven times to start really appreciating that. But what you can do with lens and, well, and does that come in with yeah. line and tone and orientation? Well, yes, it does. In fact, if you look at, you know, I think the place, the place to really start, if you want like the, I think it's the movie that sets the visual language for the seventies. And, you know, when you think of seventies urban cinema, you think of that claustrophobia and that den- denseness of the city. And if you look at Clute, which was uh, Alan Pakula film, but shot by Gordon Willis right before he shot The Godfather, you'll notice that the entire movie is shot in flat space to give you a sense of that claustrophobia. And there are only a few moments of deep space. And what I mean by flat space is they're literally up against a wall. And there are a few moments of deep space where you think that the character of of Brie has some hope. And then immediately you're back into flat space because there is no hope. So it's those, you know, those little subconscious choices make that movie, that, that, that movie gives you that feeling. And it's a result of both the lensing and the space. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just truly an art form. The last one I will mention, and then we'll move on from here is if you've, I don't know if you've seen hell or high water, I've watched it a couple times. And I, th- I, I think not. it's visual storytelling is pretty amazing. Separating these two guys, these two brothers that become bank robbers to kind of show the bank, you know, the financial system, who's boss after taking advantage of their mom. But they just do a beautiful job of there's always a fence between these two guys and the horizon, between these two guys and culture. It's you just always get this sense that, you know, they are not participating in culture as we know it or in the in the opportunities of America. And therefore, that is what propels them forward in their story. It's a terrific movie, Hell or High Water. I've watched it a couple of times now. 
just because I well enjoyed it so much. But great, yeah, I've heard it's on the queue. <laughs> so let's go back a little bit to your comedy because I was watching before we went on here uh, the promo you did, the Zucker Follies for NBC, and I was laughing my ass off. So, oh, great. <laughs> so you. you directed that. Take us into that a little bit. We'll have we'll have a link to it in our show notes because it's really really funny. Thanks. There was, you know, it's interesting when you're approaching a story. You, I think we talked about this a little. You you approach it from an analytical standpoint, the science of it, the tropes of whatever genre you're working in, the structure of the screenplay, and then there's the creative part of it, which. There are no rules for. That's the actual writing of it. And when I was at NBC, I was in promotion, which, you know, having to do 30, 20 second, 60 second, 40 second spots, it really teaches you to be an efficient storyteller because you you have to, you're selling the brand of the network or and the content, but you're, you also have to tell a great story in that amount of time. So it taught me a lot about efficiency and thinking on your feet. And I was lucky enough to be in this sort of think tank. We were in, uh, it was a, a, a pro, uh, it was in a division of NBC called NBC 2000, which by 2001 was an old name, but we kept it for a few years. Um, and we were locked in this part of this building in Burbank that had no windows. And it kind of, that, that restriction kind of freed us. We were like, you know, fuck it. <laughs> we're just going to do whatever we no want. No one could see. <laughs> Yeah, and so the analytical structural part of how they always did promos, we went, screw it. Let's find a way to do it our own way. And we ended up launching a few campaigns. We we did I did a network wide campaign that ended up winning some awards, whatever, and it was but it was it, I was I, I went backstage and I shot on old Bolex cameras all of the actors getting ready for the new season and I told the story of the toil and the work and I framed it so that it, like they were all doing it for you the audience and it worked it was like you know slightly maudlin but emotional and 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 uh, heroic and it made it made you want to watch the new shows and that was something that hadn't been done before and from that we just said you know let's let's find new ways to launch the olympics and the nba and we launched scrubs and uh west wing and will and grace and and um and then there are the do you know what the upfronts are no i don't so the upfronts are an annual event in new york city where all the advertisers get together and the networks present their fall schedule with their returning shows and their new shows and the advertisers decide, you know, how much and where to invest uh, for, you know, commercials. And so the, the networks put on very big presentations and they had, they had found out that I had directed some musical theater in my, in my past. And they asked me to do a live song and dance number on the stage of Radio City Music Hall. And I was at the point in my career where I was like ready to like leave promo and go tell longer form narrative stories. And I said, I, you know, I don't want to spend three months doing a song and dance number, but what if we did like a Christopher Guest like mockumentary where we had auditions for a, you know, faux NBC musical and they bought it. And I ended up approaching, as you can see in the, in the, in the Zucker Follies, you know, all of the stars of the NBC shows at the time to come in and audition for Megan Mullally's character, Karen, was directing the the musical. Anyway, it was like all a joke inside a joke. It was yeah. very meta. Uh, and you can you can see it. It's it's very sort of, you know, Christopher Guest using celebrity to, um, you know, turn itself on its on itself. Yeah. So this is coming on the heels of this is Spinal Tap and the mockumentary craze at the time. Yeah, I think I think you know it was uh, waiting for Guffman and the Mighty Wind, and uh, I don't know if a <laughs> Mighty Wind the had Mighty come out. Mighty Wind, yeah, point. yeah, but it was that kind of idea. Yeah, and it, actually, that that piece was very elemental in in launching me out of promo and into more of the long form narrative. Well, you were going, for, you went from long form, you studied it into the promo, and now back to long form. Can I ask you though? Let's stay in that short form, thirty second, sixty second bit for a second, because we can all learn from you as we are trying to create content and advertising and so forth to cut through the noise out there in very tiny attention span world. What insights can you provide us to how do you tell a story in 30 seconds or less that, that is intriguing enough to get somebody to click through or do the next thing? Well, I think you've got, you know, you've, you've got to find the, the hook 
whatever the the concept is, and then you've got to, and then once you've got them hooked, then I think you you grab them with some kind of person to person emotion, some relationship, because ultimately people are showing up for the characters and for the relationships. So you've you've got, I mean, and you know, you look at all the special effects, and I can look at all the car chases I've gone done, and all the fight scenes I've done, and all the visual effects I've done, and that stuff is fun and it's great, and you really, you know, I blew up a car last year. It was awesome. It went 25 feet into the air. But ultimately, what I'm most proud of are the reductive scenes, are the scenes where two people are sitting and having a moment. And so you got to hook them and then you got to grab their heart with that, uh, that emotional piece. So, I mean, that's sort of like basic structural yeah. Promotion. Uh, at least that's how we approached it. You know, some people just go go for pl- some, some people go for just for plot or concept. And I I always feel like there's something missing if you don't grab them on an emotional. Okay, level. yeah. And so when you were first started doing this, I was curious if you ever had any false starts. Like you know, you're doing something for West Wing or or Lethal Weapon, and it's just like, oh, you put it together and you looked at it, and go, nope, that didn't work, and then you had to go back and tweak it. Yeah, you know, I had it because we were so free. I had a tendency in promotion to get a little esoteric. I remember uh, <laughs> we had the we had the um, the Olympics in two th- in two thousand, and I remember seeing this video. I was watching like some you know Earth National Geographic thing, and I saw these two cheetahs racing, and and I I put some music under, it and I did this temp spot. Where I was like, and I so I did two cheetahs racing, and then I did, I had a fisherman sitting on a dock, and I pitched this story of like these two fish were competing over who could do the high jump over the fishing pole, and and then I had like two leaves in Central Park that were like racing with the wind, and I remember pitching this, and they were like, "What the fuck are you talking?" And I was like, and I think the tagline was like, "The Olympic spirit, it's everywhere," and. And they were, and I remember the 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 guy who ran the place, John uh, Miller, who's a great guy. He had this sign behind his desk, and I remember pitching it to him. And he points the sign, and the sign said, "It's the ratings, stupid." Oh, I saw that the Zucker. And I was like, right, right, yeah, 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 right. I put it in the Zucker files, and I was like, right, right, right. And I I had to constantly be reminded that like I'm still I I like if I want to make my Harold and Maude. I've got to go do that on yeah, my own. So you're letting your soulful art artistry get in the way of the tech technology or the techno storytelling. And how do you balance those two? Yeah, I mean, meanwhile, I've got to understand the brand that I'm working for, and I've got to uh, write stories and develop promos that work within that brand, but push the envelope just enough yeah. to make them different. Yeah. And how do you find that balance? Uh, well, try, trial, trial. <laughs> Trial and error, and uh, and also realizing, I think you know there was a big lesson. Also, I shot a lot of that um, behind the scenes footage that I was telling you about that we never used. And I remember that the network. It was a good lesson for me. The network, uh, the 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 promo department owned that footage, even though I had shot it. Of course, they did because they paid for it, and they repurposed it into spots that I had never intended. You know, clip spots, and they started putting in shots from the behind the scenes. And I remember at the time being very upset because I was like, "That's my stuff," and it's so you know, I was a purist about it. And and the the great lesson was, you know, there's no ownership until until you have ownership. So so ultimately, your job, and I find this. Time and time again, even to today, you know, in terms of making my days, in terms of not going too far, you know, out into an artistic field landscape uh, to basically you're going to be given limitations within a business structure and you have to meet those limitations, but you have to do it creatively. So, you know, the big expression is make it work. And once you realize you have to make it work, you stop complaining and you stop being such a purist and you 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 make it work. So you went from short form then into more long form and you were directing film and TV at this time. How how did that move work for you? What do you mean how did it work? You mean how- I mean was it what it was couldn't have been much of a leap I would imagine since you had already studied 
long form, but you, you they had you working short form at NBC for a while in the promo, in the promotional side, but then you started taking over some of the TV shows and directing those. Yeah, I started with a TV movie. Uh, there was a the guy who had created behind the music at VH1, Jeff Gaspin, was running TV movies at NBC at the time, uh, and he wanted to do this narrative retelling of the the drama that went on behind the camera on 70s and 80s sitcoms. And the one he started with, because there was a book based on it, uh, was all the conflict between Suzanne Somers and Joyce DeWitt and John Ritter on Three's Company, which was sort of a famous tale of uh, you know greed and ego and, and betrayal. And so there was a great script and I, I, had, I had put uh, Jeff Zucker in the Zucker Follies. It's named after him. And so I was able to to make an appeal to him to sort of allow me to do this film. And one thing led to another. And I was able to uh, direct that as my first long form. And then since then, what have you been working on? Well, I stayed at NBC for a while. I, I ended up doing my first episodes of television there. I did, my first episode of television was, um, I don't know if you remember, Ed the Bowling Alley Lawyer with uh, Tom Cavanaugh and Julie Bowen. I don't remember Ed the Bowling Alley Lawyer. Well, it was called just Ed, but I remember okay. it was the Bowling Alley Lawyer. So that was my first episode, and then I did uh, an episode of Scrubs, and I did an episode of The West Wing. And all of that, by the way, that was all relationships. You know, I had made good relationships doing promos for the West Wing and and putting some of the cast of the West Wing in the Zucker Follies. And those relationships led to an opportunity in the fifth season of the West Wing to do uh, a fantastic episode uh, where, you know, and that was all learning curve because I was uh, very autonomous at NBC and you are not autonomous when you are directing television. It's a totally different skill set where, again, it comes back to the make it work, but you've got to make your days and you've got to stay within the tone of the show. And you are not, uh, you are not an, you, you, you have to use your skills to, to work within the confines of the show. So you want to go make an independent movie, that's what you should do. But otherwise, you got to make it work. And you're also doing some producing work too, correct? The Exorcist on TV? Yeah, yeah. And- I started producing. There was a show called Andy Barker P.I. Uh, with Andy Richter that was mm-hmm. written by um, Jonathan Groff and Conan O'Brien. And I started producing on that show. So I started really – You re- what you realize is that as a director, you are producing – if you're doing your job right, you're producing anyway. You're making all the decisions about about every element that's coming together to achieve what you're what you're after, and so that led me down a path to continue producing because you have more you know you're more involved with the writers on a day to day basis. You're not just a guest director. Uh, you're more involved in the storytelling, which is the ultimate goal. Yeah. What do you think about this day and age with all the channels and? I just read something the other day that now there are over 500 different TV shows on compared to like 200 that were on in 2011 to see that kind of growth. Is that, I mean, I imagine it's good for the industry because you've got to have so much content, but do you see the quality ebbing with you have that much content being played out there? No, not at all. I Actually, I think, I think the quality is, I find the quality uh, improving because the, the quality, because television has become a place for the kind of storytelling that used to take the space of the cinema when we were growing up, you know, you Kramer versus Kramer would be a 10 episode series right now. Mm -hmm. You're you're not making that as a movie, you know, it would be a series about divorce and, and, and so, and so what's happened is that the, the standard of quality in television has gone up because of game of Thrones, because of Mad Men, because of sons of anarchy and the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, the, even the old model, when you go to network television, which is why I've been spending a lot of time, the expectation of what it's going to look like and the quality of the stories goes up because everybody is raising the bar for everyone else. So what is one of your favorite shows out there that you're not working on? What do you, when you're not working, what do you tune into and enjoy? Well, my wife loves all the the BBC anything BBC. So I just watched Dr. Foster and Happy Valley, which are in- both incredible in their own ways. So, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time. So I like a good five, six episode arc. Mm-hmm. 13 is, is starting to dig into my into my free time. Yeah. But I, you know, I'll, I'll do it if it's great. <laughs> now, Jason, you had told me last week, you just uh, sold a show or got picked up at Fox for a program that you're working on, film you're working on. What Tell us about that. 
so this was a this pilot has been in development for uh, a few years. Uh, it is the passage based on the Justin Cronin series of books. It's the passage of the twelve, and I. I haven't read the third one yet, so I don't recall the name of it. And it was a big hit, worldwide sci-fi sensation. And um, it was originally going to be a movie. And then Ridley Scott and Matt Reeves got involved and it turned into a TV show. They hired uh, Liz Heldens to, from Friday Night Lights to uh, write it. It went through one incarnation and then um, it was rewritten and I did a reshoot. So it, the, the pilot now is a is a combo platter of the work of Marco Siega, who's a great director who did the first version and the version uh, that I did. So they kept some of the story from the original pilot, and then we they Liz sort of rejiggered it with the network, and now it is um, it's turned into a great piece of work, and uh, people are very excited about it. So it will it will launch mid season, I believe, uh, January two thousand nineteen. Oh man, congratulations! That's great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's. It's um I don't know if you you know about it but it's it's got it's like I said it's got a great hook about uh you know a, a science experiment from a virus that leads to immortality but the side effect is vampirism so it's got this great sort of epic hook and then mostly the stories are very personal and reductive into two person scenes where it's really about the characters. So, you know, that's, I'm attracted to that big genre stuff that, that then gets very intimate, which is why I liked the exorcist so much. Yeah. So in your evolution as a storyteller, what are the main things that or themes that you've pulled away that, you know, we could learn from as we try to get better at our own content development and creation, because it just seems like the whole world now from Fox to, uh, Westworld to what we're watching on TV and on our laptops and on our digital. I mean, everybody is competing for eyeballs and attention. And it ultimately comes down to whoever tells the best story wins, whether that's a long form episodic story or a short little funny tweet that somehow they're able to pull off three act structure. So what can you share with us that, that would make us better storytellers in our own little way? That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Well, I would say the first thing is never stop learning. I think the person who says, you know, I know everything about storytelling should retire because they're at the point where they're just going to repeat themselves. And I think the idea is to grow as a storyteller and to keep learning. You know, I had a professor who said that it takes a lifetime to learn how to write a good script and a lifetime to learn how to direct a good film. And now really to get ahead, you got to write and direct your own films. So you need two lifetimes to do it in the first place. <laughs> So that's the that's the first thing. And then the second thing I would say is I think there is value. I think we talked about this before, the difference between the analytical mindset where you're studying the science of story and then the creative mindset where you're free. I think when you're when you're studying the analytical part of storytelling, yes, you can look at a script, you can know what's wrong with it, but 10 people could tell you the same thing is wrong with it. And those same 10 people will give you 10 different solutions in, on how to fix it. And so it's about finding your grounding. It's about finding your voice as, as a storyteller and as a filmmaker so that you can solve the, the, the uh, empirical problems with your creative mind. Does that make sense? You know, I think the science stuff is like two plus two is four, but the creative stuff, and I think this is true of, of any good movie, a movie is telling you that two, two plus two is five, and it's, it's explaining why along the way. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, because then I suppose it brings you along as the audience, as making you a part of the story because you've got to do the math and it helps you kind of connect those dots. Yeah, because if you know two plus two is four, you're going to figure it out, which is, you know, partly the problem with these formulaic films that are meeting, you know, release dates in 2019 and 2020. And you, you see it sometime in the Marvel films uh, where you, you know what's coming. And the reason you know what's coming is because it's almost too formulaic. So you've got to find the balance between telling stories that are familiar, but telling them in ways that you can't predict. Mm -hmm. Deadpool. Just watched it last week. Have you seen, you see the Deadpool franchise? I love that. Hilarious. <laughs> Talking about meta storytelling. I just think I'm, I'm not a huge Marvel fan to begin with. Uh, but when I f saw the first one, I died laughing. I thought this is brilliant. I thought the second one was equally as good. Oh yeah. I haven't seen the second one yet. Yeah. The other thing I would say just in terms of you know, little, little seminal tidbits that I've learned along the way is always trust your original instinct. You're going to be very excited about an idea when it comes to you. And the process of going from, 
idea to page and then page to screen and then screen to editing is going to be taxing and exhausting and debilitating. And you're going to give up, you know, three quarters of the way through and you're going to want to start working on something else. And I think it's important to remember that initial burst of enthusiasm because that's that's uh, Kubrick always said that he like did 65 drafts of something and the studio kept giving him notes and he got lost along the way. And he remembered going back to his first draft and saying, right, right, right. That's what I, that's what I was after. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, there's a Hebrew blessing about finding inspiration in the beginning. And I think that's an important part of storytelling to remind yourself why you started telling the story in the first place. Yeah. And finally, Jason, how do you get back at all those bullies in punking your own audience in some of your storytelling? There must be some fun you have with it. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. I'm always looking for the twist, you know, for the revelate, for the reveal, for the thing that you didn't expect. And I, you know, the, the narrative is one thing, but, but then telling the story and building anticipation is quite another. So I still, I'm still figuring it out. Uh, you know, the difference between mystery and surprise and suspense and what's correct for the story in that moment. And if I can, if I can, you know, filmmaking is an illusion, you know, it's all an illusion. It's all a manipulation. It's made to feel real, but it's all false. So if I can manipulate the audience into crying or laughing or shuddering in fright, then I guess that's my revenge. <laughs> well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. I mean, really, really fascinating stuff. I get to live vicariously through my guests and I would have would have had so much fun in your career uh, over the past 20 years had, had I had the guts to try to go after it. So I really enjoy having you here. Well, it's not too late. So come come uh, come see us. <laughs> well, we do it all in our own little way and, you know, in advertising, marketing and branding. But um, that's what the business of story is all about. We really appreciate your time and your insight. Oh, thank you so much, Park. Thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. Be sure to come back next week when we'll have another story artist on, like Jason, to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And in the meantime, if I could be of service to you, you know where to find me, businessofstory.com. And until you're back again next week, feel free to share this episode with some friends and family if you like what you heard. That's how we grow our reach and uh, help share folks like Jason around the world. So thanks for listening. And remember that the most potent story you are ever going to tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.